Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, is everybody awake? Yep, almost. Okay, good to hear. Um, so my name is Conrad Parker. I uh, I live in Kyoto in Japan, and um, I'm actually studying a PhD at Kyoto University. And today I'm going to talk about some part-time work that I've been doing with um, with Renesas, which is a uh, process manufacturer in Tokyo. Um, I work with a couple of other foreigners in a much larger division of um, based on open source division. Um, the the company Renesas has uh, is pretty well embracing Linux and open source. A lot of the previous customers were or have been using iTron, which is a um, very popular operating system for uh, embedded devices in Japan. Um, and many customers are moving towards Linux. So what we're actually developing is a um, is complete kernel interfaces and um, application stack for uh, development on on Linux platforms using using our processors. Um, what the Processes I'm going to talk about today are uh, the super, uh, SH mobile processors. So I'll give an introduction to what to what they are, um, and also some of the work that I've been doing um, for them. Uh, let's see, including um, ways of sharing UIO devices and OpenMax components. So um, I'll I'll give some I'll give an introduction to the to the hardware platform um, and discuss the way that the kernel interfaces have been implemented. Uh, OpenMax is, a, um, is an open standard for multimedia plugins, multimedia handling. And um, I want to give a bit of an overview of that because I think it's quite useful generally for people doing Linux mobile stuff um, and also towards I even like um, multimedia on the desktop and so on. LibSH Codex. Codex is a um, just set of wrapper libraries I've made for some of our multimedia codecs. Um, this work that I've been doing, SH Codex and OpenMax SH, the um, plugins for them, are being released as um, under LGPL and, and other appropriate open source licenses, but unfortunately there um, there is a dependency on some binary codec blobs, so it's not completely open source. Um, and lastly, some resource management issues um, and a library and some tools, uh, UIO marks, which are useful for uh, managing devices that use UIO. So I'll go through and explain each of these things. So first of all, the um, processor set, the processor family, SH Mobile's 32-bit RISC application processors, system on chips, basically with um, with a few nice function blocks. The two I've been working on um, 7722's SH4 instruction set goes up to about 266. Um, 7723, bit of an extended instruction set includes floating point unit, current up to 400. The gist seems to be that the um, uh, the company is ramping up production to faster clock rates and um, more powerful application processes in future, but currently getting um uh, getting things working at these at these rates. If we look at uh, uh, this the, if you go to the Renesis homepage and click to Renesis.com and then click on SH Mobile, there's actually a bit of a roadmap of where the processes are going. Um, so I've only been working on two of these so far. Currently, I'm uh, starting to port stuff to the the top pink one in the corner, uh, which is a G3 platform, which um, uh, has a mixed instruction set and um, we're targeting that towards Android devices. So I'll, I'll run through some of the um, some of the blocks. I think I've tried to keep what I'm talking to to what's available publicly. I think uh, if we click on some of these, then we can actually get some other information about um, about the processes themselves and what what features are available. Um, they have various processing blocks which are available through memory map registers. Um, 
the VPU is a video processing unit, which is what I've been mainly working with. Uh, video I.O. units, which I'll explain. Um, onboard JPEG, encoding, decoding, LCD controller, video output, sound, USB, and so on. Um, the VPU has uh, integrated MPEG-4 and H.264 encoding and decoding. Um, and we actually get a couple of uh, the hardware is actually capable of doing a few streams in parallel. Um, I'll, I'll be explaining more what I've done with that. Uh, the camera interface can, uh, on, on the chip, can uh, take in a couple of YUV formats and do sync, do sync for the video stream. Uh, VEU, video engine unit, can do um, very fast color space conversion between a few different formats. Um, dithering when there's RGB color subtraction, filtering, um, mirroring point symmetry, 9 degree, deblocking, median filters, and so on. Basically, in, uh, so that, that those kind of functions can be used by applications. We've got some M player patches and so on. Um, I think the VU supports in M player currently, um, which Magnus Dam's been working on. Um, and that, that code can then be reused by the people who are doing um, custom applications. Uh, blending engine unit, which can do picture in picture and graphic combining and so on in, in hardware, so you can uh, mix video streams, place them into each other, overlay graphics, and so on. Uh, there's DSP on 7722. That's actually this this development board here is the MIGO R development board, um, which has that that chip on it. Um, DSP extended function, so we're using that for MP3 and AAC and so on. Okay, so I'll explain some of the kernel interfaces that um, that have been developed for this. Uh, using standard interfaces, V4L2, FBDEV, dev UIO, and I'll explain how each of these work. Um, who is familiar with V4L2, who's worked on capture devices? A couple of people. Yep, right. So it's, um, it's, it's fairly simple and provides, the API provides a few different ways of, of getting images in. Um, which you actually support, of course, depends on the um, on, on the driver. Uh, of course, when we're, we're we're just developing, our company develops the chips. Um, we're developing interfaces to them, and for example, here this this is a BSP. It has a particular little camera on it. Um, of course, that's not something that we're um, that's not part of our chip, obviously, right? That's just you know something you can plug in. So um, the it's still always up to the particular. Uh, of manufacturer of a device who uses these this hardware to um, to do the final camera chip, the, the final camera driver, but uh, can interface with the CEU on the on the application processor. Um, in V4L2, the most the simplest way to get data in off the camera off the V4L2 interface is to use the read system call, but it's not very efficient. Um, there's a streaming interface, so you can provide memory buffers and directly stream um, into them. A lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of the, the function interfaces on our chips actually, um, the hardware requires access to physical contiguous memory, so we set that up. Um, and so it's, then it's fast, you can reduce mem copies if you can stream directly into the, into the memory that's going to be used anyway. Um, and V4L2 also then allows you to change other parameters on the fly even while you're, while you're streaming. Um, FB does pretty straightforward. Uh, stand interface for handling video output. So we've got an LCD controller on, on the chip, and we can um, we can do that in a standardized way. And UIO, I probably want to talk a bit about. Who here is? Is anyone here familiar with UIO? Has worked with it? Dispano? No, anyone else? A few people. No. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fairly recent, and um, it does allow driver logic to be implemented in user space. So it's two parts. There's a very thin kernel interface, um, and then there's a, um, a, a way for user space applications to interface with that. Uh, available for child drivers, and uh, basically what you do for each device that you want to um, make available via UIO, 
Um, instead of including all of the device driver code in the kernel and kernel module, you provide a very small kernel module which exports some memory maps um, and then just provides some stubs, some stub functions for, for interrupt handling and for I.O. And then a user-space device driver can use normal read and map system calls and so on to work with the device. And uh, yeah, for this, for this kind of thing, it works very well. The kernel module um, provides a struct specifying the IQ number, um, some flags for the setup, and a handler callback. So when an interrupt occurs, the kernel handler will um, acknowledge that. It also sets up an array of memory areas. These are mapped into user space. So um, especially here where we need physically contiguous memory, then we can set that up in the kernel side. Um, and then export through um, through the, the PROC interface where those memory errors are available. And the kernel modules also provide um, provide file ops members and map open release and so on. I'll support for them. From the user space, um, a process will open something like devuio. Um, you can actually I mentioned the PROC interface. You, uh, you can actually read straight out of um, uh, straight out of SIS what the uh, what the memory maps are. So what devices are available, what names they have, uh, what addresses are available at. Um, you can simply you simply pull in the file descriptor for them for the uh, device, and reading it just gives you the number of events that are available there. Um, and then you can access the memory that, that you require. So for example, with the, um, the VPU, the video processing unit, we have um, the, the chip requires to be able to get the, its input, input data um, from some physically contiguous memory and then write to, um, to, me to such memory. Uh, so if you're encoding data, then you need to get complete video frames in if that's coming in off the camera, to, off the CU, off the camera, um, or you just write it in from, from a file or whatever. Um, and similarly, decoding, uh, where you need to be able to um, get encoded data in and write out the output either to, again, to random user memory or to the LCD controller. OK, so but, yes, question. Mm -hmm. How does UIO relate to that? Is, that? is UIO going to replace low latency option, or is it usable to implement it? Because that gives right. powers to user space that it doesn't normally have. OK, so, uh, so the question was about whether UIO is going to be used for sound. Um, sound devices, I, I don't know about that. Um, but, uh, I think it's generally useful for custom devices. So, su such as the devices on these chips, um, whereas there's already a, a specified sound interface in, in the Linux kernel, which is probably more useful for for sound access. This is really more a way of um, of making generic, uh, of uh, having a very generic ac mechanism for for device drivers, um, so that you don't need to clutter the kernel with very specific things. Okay, so um, just yeah, just a, a, a note on all, on all that and different um, interfaces. I'm actually really, um, I'm really happy with the, the company I'm working with. The, um, to have a manager who will go into client meetings or meetings with partners and so on and explain to them the kernel development process and um, you know how important it is to work with the upstream community and uh, you know convince them to to push code upstream. Um, the guys I work with, Paul Munt is the uh, Linux SH kernel maintainer, and Magnus Dam, who's done um, this driver development, um, you know, have have really been pushing for that. And um, with our BSP releases currently, we're releasing both for an older kernel, which um, which the company's been supporting, with a two six twenty four for um, for customers, but also the current um, the current head. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's it's really working directly with the community, and a lot of this code goes in 
into immediate kernel releases. And all that stuff's in the kernel already in the main line. Okay, so I just want to explain a bit now about OpenMax, um, which is a target that I've been working towards um, supporting for, the, for this hardware. OpenMax generally, it's a set of cross-platform APIs for multimedia codecs for application portability in multimedia. There's three layers to it. OpenMax IL, integration layer, is a way of wrapping um, hardware codecs. OpenMax development layer and application layer are higher level ways of, um, of synchronizing codecs and managing, managing their use in applications. OpenMax is itself specified by the Kronos group. It's the same group that made OpenGL, um, OpenAL, and so on. So it's actually getting quite a lot of industry support. OpenMax IL is the, um, the lowest level. So you can sort of think of, uh, think of that just like OpenGL is, a, um, is in some part a interface, a software API interface to 3D hardware. OpenMax IL gives you a software interface, a standard software interface to hardware codecs. Um, it doesn't provide any interface of synchronization um, or necessarily for playback and so on. Um, but what it does give you is a very straight C API for getting data in and out. Um, you implement a buffer management callback, it's called, where you just get memory buffers in and out after a bit of setup. Um, you advertise again through through C query interface, what functions you provide. So if you um, provide encoding or decoding of H.264 or whatever, you exactly specify that. Um, and then the OpenMax components are, are made available as .so files. An application can load them up and query query each library and see what's available and then plug them together itself. Um, so it's, it's pretty low level, um, but it does allow the hardware to be um, to be encapsulated in a very small, small set of libraries of .SOs. Uh, the other two layers, DL and AL, um, they suffer from a little bit of lack of implementation existence. Um, but I'll explain what they are anyway. Um, IL, IL, the earlier layer, the lower layer, that was um, finalized last year, and there's implementations for that which I'll talk through. But um, DL, so I probably ripped this off the OpenMax webpage like six months ago or something. Um, there are, these APIs are defined. They're much more complex than the IL one. Um, specifying imaging functions and so on uh, for hardware engines and DSPs and, uh, and what have you. Um, yeah, I don't really understand how that fits in there because all those things are implemented in IL codecs otherwise. But um, AL is the one that is really what people would want for application development, um, providing synchronization, allowing you to route um, a routing mechanism between components and so on. Uh, I actually wrote this slide for um, something I was explaining to guys at work about six months ago, and at that point it said it will be expected to be finalized at the end of 2008. I just changed the tense last week. Um, that, uh, that was still getting feedback. And um, that's really the more, the most complex part of part of it, I guess. Or that's the part which will negotiate between um, between components and synchronize to a clocking component and so on. Um, but of course, all the lower lower layers have to be um, widely supported before that can be that can be done. Um, there's a few implementations of OpenMax IL in existence, so we'll talk about IL. Um, Bellagio is an open source implementation developed by ST Micro and Nokia, and um, it's getting quite a bit of support. That's the one I've been working towards so far. Um, provides a, a shared library because, of, of course, each of these components, th there'll be a lot of common functionality in implementing a component, in, um, in managing the, um, the ports, which are the ways of sh are the, um, the, the interfaces for sharing data. So you can say this is a video input port, its type is H.264 frames or whatever. Um, and you, know, you set up what color space you have, or for audio, what sample rate and channels you're, you're using. Um, all that kind of management, of course, it's useful to have common functions. And so each of these implementations will provide a library which you can then link into your component to make it easy to develop components. Um, 
TI also have an OpenMax implementation. Uh, it's that they've, um, I haven't played with that directly. They've released some code. Um, Philippe Contreras, who works on Bellagio stuff, actually has a Git tree of that on GitHub, which builds apparently, which is nice. Um, OpenCore is the multimedia framework used in Android. And OpenCore itself, it's um, developed by Packet Video. It's part of the Android reference um, uh, reference code platform. is um, is a much wider multimedia framework, but at the lowest level, it also uses OpenMax IL for the um, for the codec access. And my next bit of work is actually porting my stuff from um, from Bellagio to OpenCore for Android support. Um, now, since it's useful to mention GStreamer here, um, anyone who's familiar with Linux desktop stuff might be familiar with GStreamer, and um, of course it covers a lot of the same scope of functionality. Um, whereas OpenMax um, provides access to the hardware, GStreamer is really good at negotiation, at finding, um, finding a, a series of plugins which will give you a specific functionality set. So for example, you might say, I've got this stream coming in off the network, um, and it's some random video codec. I don't know what it is. And I need to be able to output to an RGB surface over here. Give me a set of plugins in between, which will make it work. And GStreamer can set that kind of thing up. Um, and also ensure that you've got synchronization, even if you have multiple, um, multiple video streams and mixing and so on going on. Um, so probably a good way to a good way to go may be to use OpenMax IL at the lowest layer. Um, there is there already is OpenMax GStreamer um, wrappers and they're actually very thin. So a it's a, a GStreamer plugin, um, maybe just a couple hundred lines of code if that, which wraps and which wraps an OpenMax component. Um, which may seem like a bit of unnecessary overhead, but it does then mean that you get all the negotiation and synchronization aspects already working from GStreamer. Um, really just um, needs being played with. I think the Nokia guys are actually developing, are actually working with that currently. And I just want to mention, um, because this is a, a free software conference, um, in ziff.org, so there are many uh, free codecs. Um, Ogwebus, Theora, Drax, Speaks, Cult, Flack, and so on. And you can hear about a lot of these at this conference as well. Um, Ogwebus is actually part of the OpenMax IL specification. So each of these implementations include Ogwebus support. Um, they do generally, uh, like Bellagio, for example, includes Ogwebus as a single component, whereas in reality, Og is a container format and it'd be nicer to have Ogmux, Dmux components as separate things and then implement um, IL components for each codec. So this is actually something that um, we were discussing at the Farms workshop last week, which is a multimedia workshop. And um, we're going to kick off during LCA or um, over the, you know, fr from now onwards. Um, and the benefit of that to the free software community would then be that we have uh, software uh, OpenMax IL interfaces for each of these codecs. Um, and if hardware manufacturers can be encouraged to then develop hardware implementations of some of these, then applications can be ready to go. So it's just it's just good generally for people to be aware of, of OpenMax, which is why I've been trying to push it a lot here. Okay. Um, so now I'm just going to move on to uh, some of the stuff I've been working on. Um, as I said, unfortunately, this... Uh, has dependency on some binary blobs, which do the um, which do the lowest level management of the hardware. Um, but nevertheless, I'll just have a bit of a discussion. Um, SlibSH Codex is a, a very simple set of libraries for um, uh, for managing the VPU, MPEG-4 and H.264 codecs on these processors. Um, it is. This is actually quite similar to some work I've to work I've done for um, uh, for ziff.org from wrapping Og and um, and Volbus and Speaks and so on. 
and making standardized APIs or simpler APIs. Um, where are we here? Uh, we basically just get a very, very, very simple API for um, setting up a decoder and then uh, passing data to it and having it call back a callback whenever you have, whenever it has um, frames of data for you. Uh, very simple, um, and we've used this for so if, um, for some employer demos, which are not upstream yet, um, and for the Open Mac stuff internally. Um, and encoder, similarly where you just uh, actually get callbacks for both input and output because the chip wants to be in charge of the, of the data it's getting and where it's writing it to and the timing for that. So it's a bit different to, um, uh, to some of the other encoder, to, to a pure software encoder library. Um, yes, it's kind of this stuff has taken some of the um, some of the example code down from a few thousand lines to like fifty lines or so to actually get encoding and decoding happening. Of course, if you do want really low-level control, um, the uh, the VPU hardware has a couple of hundred registers for control for um, specifying exactly how you want to be doing H.264 encoding in particular. Um, and that requires pretty detailed knowledge of how H.264 works if you want to make use of that. And that's also possible. Um, but it turns out that most people really just want to be able to get some data and get a YEV field out of it. Wait. Benno. Are those libraries wrappers around an OpenMax AL component, or is this what the OpenMax AL component uses? Right. Yeah, no. Uh, Second one. This is what the OpenMax IL stuff uses. Yeah. So I made this as generic. Uh, it's just generic libraries, which you know, specif specifically for this hardware. Um, the OpenMax stuff. Well, I'm going to show that next anyway. Um, uh, the OpenMax stuff uses this. I could show code if we, well, whatever. Um, anyway, the OpenMax stuff uses this and also advertises this is an H.264 encoder, this is an H.264 decoder, sets up OpenMax ports and so on. So that's all OpenMax specific stuff. Um, whereas, like for example, the M player stuff just says, just writes into an M player screen buffer and so on. Right, and Bludger components as well. So. Um, these things I've been working on are going to be released as LGPL. Uh, lastly, the um, resource allocation problem. So we have all these various IP blocks, and it's quite nice for a, um, an application might want to be able to use multiple of these at the same time. Um, and on a um, uh, on a syst on a Linux system, then you're going to have you, you may have multiple applications working at the same time. Um, and so you need ways of sharing these resources. Um, so for example, the uh, VPUs, half duplex, you want to be able to encode and decode separately. Um, and you, the, the uh, device might set up a large memory map, a lot might, alloc might set aside a large physically contiguous area you need to be able to share that between multiple applications. So you might have, um, if you've got two encoders happening at the same time, then they each need to be able to have their own input and output areas. Um, so the job of memory management of those is actually up to user space because um, this is all happening in user space. <coughs> um, hence LibioMux, which does these kinds of things. And I've designed this so that it's generically useful for anyone who's developing UIO devices and and applications using them. Um, register, save, and restore. Like I said, for the VPU, we've got a couple of hundred registers, so you need to be able to actually maintain your state with them. Um, management of the memory maps and uh, event dispatch. Um, so UI marks a uh, shared library, um, sort of runs on demand. You don't want to have daemons 
running around just to manage this kind of thing. Um, can query for the resources available. Um, can manage shared manage mutexes for access to it and um, uh, and the memory that's used. And as far as locking goes, uh, we want to be able to make sure we have deterministic locking. So if you're using multiple of multiple um, processor functions um, and a different application might be using a different subset of processor functions, then you want to be able to make sure that you don't deadlock um, between when switching between apps. Quite simple. Um, the map management, so the kernel doesn't always doesn't really have any way of knowing which applications or, or can't more finely grain. Uh, the UIO interface does not provide a way for fine-grained locking of um, memory regions. So before we were using UIO, there was a, we had a custom device, DevVPU, for managing this stuff. Um, and of course, that does allow you to, um, that does allow you kernel level protection on, on the memory regions. Uh, once you get to UIO, then you can't do that. Um, but that's cool. User space resource sharing is fine. Event dispatch. Um, when you get an event from UIO, you, uh, uh, when you pull the file descriptor, you simply get a count of events that are available, but suddenly that file descriptor is being shared by multiple users, so um, you don't always know which event is for you. Actually, it turns out that you that an application generally locks, um, has sole access to that device for the period of um, starting off a process and getting interrupt back. Uh, more, concre more concretely, when you do, for example, decoding of a video packet, then you place the packet into the input memory. You, um, you hit register to say that you want some decoding done. Then you go away, and the VPU interrupts you back when the decoding is done and the um, new data is in the output memory. And um, it can't really be doing anything during that time anyway, so you just hold on to it. Um, I actually just wanted to cover one other thing I forgot to write a slide about, but that doesn't matter. Uh, with OpenMax, which is quite interesting. Um, so on that, on that topic of having multiple um, multiple functions, multiple CPU functions, which might be being used by an application. So for example, you have um, camera input and then uh, video encode and color space conversion and so on. Um, of course, you don't need to, between each of these, you don't need to be sending the data across the memory bus, right? The components in the chip can actually talk directly to each other. Um, Whereas when you're developing generic components for OpenMax or GStreamer, then you want to, the APIs specify that you're just producing memory buffers, which, are, um, which can be directly accessed. So there's a technique which is just simply known as tunneling, where the components, if you get two hardware components talking to each other, you happen to plug them together. Um, during negotiation, they work out that they're both hardware components and they could just sort of share the data via a back door. Um, then they do that. And that negotiation actually has to happen up at a level like GStreamer, where negotiation is occurring. Um, so you have, so if you have two, two OpenMax IL components, which are going to talk to each other, and for each of them you have a GStreamer wrapper, at the point when the uh, GStreamer negotiation goes on, they work out right where both hardware components. So you provide a control interface for each of the OpenMax components um, to say, look, use this other backdoor, just go straight through the CPU. And, um, uh, and then you get more efficiency that way. So you use message boxing directly there. And um, that's, uh, that's part of our roadmap for the future processes, which I can't really talk about right now, but they have much. Um, have a few different instruction cores and um, uh, different ways of passing passing data around. Uh, it's what Nokia's done. Oh, it's, sorry, TI's done that with their processors with their OMAP stuff, and um, the Nokia guys have been developing that recently within the Bellagio tree as well.
Um, so it's kind of a, ev even though GStreamer, for example, seems like a fairly large and you know bulky API, and uh, when you can pull tricks like that, then it means that you can get this, you know, it's sort of really generic, um, generic application uh, framework, and developers can just act as though they're passing memory buffers between each other, even though they're not. So you actually get good low-level performance um, with a really simple high-level API, and you can continue to, you know, write high-level video, uh, you know, teleconferencing apps in Python or whatever. I don't know, and um, and you still get like you know the decent performance on the hardware. Um, future work, I haven't, I'm not writing text about this, but um, uh, basically we're working towards Android support for um, the G3 set of processors we're developing, um, and Skype support. Skype is using OpenMaxIL for its um, codec input. Um, so hopefully that'll just plug in and work. We're porting that currently. Um, and I was, where's Rob? Rob at the back. I was talking to Rob recently. He was at, at Farms, and he's going to be doing a talk tomorrow at the Multimedia Mini Conf about Ganache, free Flash implementation. Um, and I'm pretty interested in getting importing that and making that work, perhaps with with OpenMax or SH Codex or whatever. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of lot of interesting work, um, and you know it's it's fun to do. Any questions? Okay. Um, yeah. So the the question was, do the multiple um, Open Max implementations work together? And um, uh, yeah, in theory, yes, because they just export a um, a standardized C API. Um, obviously, if there are other um, implementation issues, then we'll see how that works. Um, I'm not taking my chances, which is why I'm actually just going to write some open core stuff directly rather than hope that the Blogger stuff works. Any other questions? And in terms of distribution, it'll just be easy to, to work with what, what's already there. <laughs>